Well, we're continuing the series, You Asked For It. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit the last two weeks. And as we continued through, I thought, God, we got to give another week to it. And honestly, we could do an entire series on on the Holy Spirit, but we're not going to because we're going to get to some of the other things. So if you didn't ask for the Holy Spirit, we're going to get to what you asked for at some point. Uh, But today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. The first week, what we talked about is who the Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God that comes and lives among us and lived among his people, but now dwells within us if you're a follower of Jesus. The second week, we talked about what the Holy Spirit does. And we talked about the fact that he is the spirit of truth, that he comes and brings comfort. He comes and brings direction. He comes and teaches us. He reminds us all the things that Jesus has taught us. He does a multitude of things. He gives us gifts to be used for the betterment of the common good of everyone. And as I said last week, and I'll say again this week, it's important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is a he, it's not an it. That the Holy Spirit is is a person. He's a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he has a will and he has a motion. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. And you can grieve what he wants to do in and through you. And you can shut him down. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can do a lot of things to the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, some people have said that the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman, that if you don't want the Holy Spirit as a part of your life, he will happily step away and give you exactly what you're asking for. And so now we move to the place where it's really the question of, so what is our role in this? What is our role in the Holy Spirit? If God has placed his very spirit in us and placed his very spirit among us, Jesus said, it's better for you that I leave so that the Holy Spirit will come, that I will send the Holy Spirit. And so what is our role? And so today we're going to talk about what it means to walk in the Spirit. And as we watched on that video, I don't know how many of you recall and remember what it was like to begin to learn to walk. Probably none of you. If anyone in this room remembers what it was like when they began to walk, I want you to come talk to me. You are savant, and we're going to write a book and make millions of dollars of your remembrance ability. But none of us remember what it's like to learn to walk. And yet we see in this video kind of what is involved in the walking. One of the things is that it is, it's precarious, You're trying to get your legs underneath you. You're trying to figure out and you're wobbling and stuff like this. And here's the thing that that everyone around, if you got kids, you know this, everyone around knows that the kid's going to fall. Everyone does. And the kid has kind of this innate thing in them because their legs are going like this. The kid knows that they're going to fall. And yet, did you see it? This smile from ear to ear. I mean, they're about to hit their tail, they're about to hit their face, they're about to go down, and yet they're going, woo yeah, this is good. <laughs> when you and I walk in the Spirit, is that what you feel? When you're walking with Jesus, is that what you feel? Do you feel that? Even, even though you feel like your legs are kind of wobbling? Because all of us in this room are at different, different places in following Jesus. All of us in this room are at different places in fully understanding who the Holy Spirit is in us. But there's still a joy. You know why? Because God is the God of life. He's the God that brings life into us. And so when we walk with the Spirit, He brings life into us. And so I want to go back in the book of Galatians just really quickly because it's important for us to understand the context of what Paul's saying in Galatians 5 about walking in the Spirit. It's found in Galatians 4 4. This is what the Word of God says. And when the right time came, God sent His Son born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Jesus for us. And God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So when we walk in the Spirit, the reason we're walking in the Spirit is because of our relationship. The reason we're walking in the Spirit of God is because God sent Jesus to die for us. And in believing in who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And in dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. 
Abba, Father, and this has been debated. Some people say that Abba in Aramaic means daddy, and, and that's been kind of disproven. But what it does mean is this. The, the term Abba, Father, means a term of intimacy. It's a term of closeness. It's not a God who set the world in motion and then stepped away and said, good luck, I hope you, I hope you figure it out. It's a God who steps in close. It's a God who moves into our space. It's Jesus becoming the incarnate presence of God in our space with us. And that's who God is. And that's his love for us, that we can cry out, Abba, Father. Do you know who else cried out, Abba, Father? Jesus did. We get to cry out with Jesus, Abba, you, God, are close to me. Y'all, that's unsettling for some people because there's some of us in this room, we didn't have that closeness with our dads. We didn't have that closeness with our father. I expressed what my dad used to do, but here's the other aspect of my dad. My dad didn't speak his love to us very often. He didn't communicate it that way. I've got three letters that he wrote to me over my lifetime. And in those letters, he expressed and communicated his love to me. In very tangible, I mean, very profound ways through his words. But knowing my granddad, I know kind of where my dad came from because my dad was not, my granddad was not an affectionate man. In fact, some of the things that my dad said, he said to, my granddad said to my dad were beyond disaffectionate. And so the fact that my dad gave me what he gave me, it means that he had extended beyond what my grandfather gave him. And I'm hoping and praying that what I give my children has been extended beyond what I got from my dad. My dad was imperfect. I'm imperfect. My children are going to be imperfect in the expression of their love to their children. But here's the beautiful thing. God is a perfect God. God is a perfect father. He is a good, good father in a way that you and I can't understand or comprehend. And he moves close to us in intimacy that we can cry out through his Holy Spirit, Abba, Father, is that your cry? Is that the cry of your heart? As we talked about in the first week, that is the very presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the very presence of God in our midst. Do we cry out, God, more of you, Abba, Father, come in. We had a guy on staff one time, and in our staff meeting, we were sitting there, and it's really kind of the first time that we were praying together, and he knelt down, and he started his prayer, Papa. And man, it just got quiet in our office. And, and I want to say prayer kind of stopped because everybody's going, Pop, Papa, what? And everybody's looking at him going, what did, what did you just say? Well, that's what he called his dad. And he felt that intimacy with God. Do you cry out, Abba, Father, to God? Because he's that close to you. He pursues you. We did a baptism this morning in the first worship experience. To see Alana Jean, just her eyes were wide open. She was, her eyes were huge. And to know the love that Connor and Lauren have for her, the Father's love for you extends so far greater. So that's what we're walking in the Spirit in, that relationship. So as we continue in Paul's writing in Galatians 5, this is what he says in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of your flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, in Scripture, to walk means to conduct your life accordingly. It means to live your life in such a way that you are walking by the Spirit. In, in verse 18 of this chapter, Paul says that we are led by the Spirit. And this is what we really need to understand, that we're not walking on our own. We're not making our own way. We're not doing it ourselves. It is the Spirit of God living through us. That word led by the Spirit is that He is in front. He is leading us, guiding us to a certain place. But what that word also means is that He carries us. So the Holy Spirit is carrying us, moving us, guiding us, leading us into this place of holiness and righteousness that God has for us through Jesus, through the power of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading you. So walk in the Spirit. 
But that still leaves it kind of vague. I mean, some of us, in regard to understanding the Spirit, we've talked about it three weeks. You may have done a Bible study about it. You may have, you may have studied the Holy Spirit significantly, but here's, we never will fully understand the Spirit. And so at some point, all of us are having wobbly legs in our understanding and walking in the Spirit. So what does this look like? And I think a great place to look is found over in Deuteronomy. And the writer of Deuteronomy, I think, gives us a clear understanding in a very concise way of what this looks like. It's found in Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. This is what the Word of God says. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So to walk in the Spirit, to move in the Spirit, is to give everything that you've got in following Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit living in you, moving you, guiding you, carrying you. And it's moving with everything. It's waking up in the morning and saying, God, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to love you with everything I have. And then about an hour later, because you may have driven in Baton Rouge, about an hour later, you're giving back going, God, I'm going to give you everything that I am. And I'm going to love you with everything. But remember, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So, we're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to walk in the spirit of truth. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Whose truth? Not our truth, the truth of God. And so the writer of, of, of Deuteronomy kind of expresses this. He says this in verse 7. Actually, right above this in verse 6, he says, These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. They're to be in you, in the place that you make choices in the very essence of your being, that's where they're supposed to be. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. So it starts off saying, repeat them to your children. Y'all, for us to know what to repeat to our children, we have to know what the Word of God says. We got to know what the truth is, right? Right? And so we repeat them to our children and we keep them in front of our kids. And we challenge the first worship experience, and I'll say it to you as well. When Alana Jean was up here being baptized, I said to the, to the congregation that was sitting there that you have to make a commitment to live your life in such a way with Christ being poured out of you, being lived out in you, walking in the Spirit, that Alana Jean, as she lives among us, will see Christ in such a way that when she comes to accept Jesus, it will be such a natural movement because she's seen it tangibly in your life and in my life. So you, you speak it to your kids over and over and over again. And I would even say, speak it to yourself. But y'all, if we don't know the word of God, if we don't know the truth of God, how are we going to be speaking that to ourselves? And then he goes on and says, talk about him when you sit down in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Uh, are there any other times? We're supposed to be talking about the truth of the Word of God. We're supposed to, it's supposed to be in our hearts so it just kind of pours out as we're living our life, as we're walking in the Spirit. The truth of who God is is just being poured out. The only way that that's going to happen is for us to get the truth of God into us. There's some of us that we've read the same book over and over again, and we can quote chapter and paragraph of, of that particular book, or we've seen the movie five times. And we say that we see something new in the movie every time. And so we can quote, have you been around people like that who can quote movies? It's just, it's freakish. You say, hey, that scene, they're like, yeah, it talks like this. And, and you're just like, what, how, what do you do with your time? What if we gave our time and our energy to the truth and the word of God in that same way? And that we were able to talk about it freely and openly with wherever we were, with whomever we are. And then it moves on. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on the city gate. And so I'm, as I'm reading this, I start thinking, it's a post-it life. That's what it is. So you carry around post-its and you write the truth on it. And then you're just like, bam. 
and you write the truth on it, and you're right here, and you write the truth on it. Remember your arm, and then you write the truth on it, and you're like, forehead. I need to put the Word of God on my forehead. Here's the great thing about it, is the reason it needs to be a symbol on your forehead is because when you walk up to somebody else, the truth of the Word of God is right there. You know what the first thing that they see? If they're looking in your eyes, they see the truth of the Word of God. Do you know the truth in order that you can walk in the Spirit of God? And be able to live it out. It's a post-it life, y'all. That's what walking in the Spirit is. But here's the great thing about it. I left one of these on earlier and it bothers some people. Okay, so, <laughs> so it says if we walk in the Spirit, hear this truth. We will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How incredible would that be for you? You may have a pet sin. You may have something that you do in your life. You may have something that you really, you hate in your life. You don't want it in your life. And what Paul says is if you walk in the Spirit, you will not do those things. Do you believe in the power of the Spirit of God? Do you believe in the power of the very presence of God living in you? That if you walk in Him, that you will not do those things. You won't give in to the desires. And it means the lust and the passion, these uncontrollable lusts and passion that just rise up in you and move you to places and, and cause you to do things that you don't want to do. If you walk in the Spirit, you don't have to do those things. Man, that should get a, that should get a clap or, a, or an amen because it's the Word of God and it tells us that you don't have to be bound by those things anymore. I don't have to be bound by those things anymore if we walk in the Spirit. I just don't think we believe that anymore. I think we become so comfortable, not comfortable, but it's like, oh, it's going to always be there. No, it's not. Because the Spirit of God is more powerful than those things in our lives. And so then he goes on and he says, For the flesh desires that which is against the spirit. The spirit desires that which is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other so that you cannot do what you want. Do you all see that the flesh and the spirit are at war with each other? They are not. The flesh and the spirit cannot coexist. They can't. But our world tells us that they can. Our world tells us that I can do a little bit of the flesh and I don't have to feel really guilty about it, just a little bit guilty because it's not really that bad because I know some other people that are worse than me and I can do some of the things of the Spirit and I'm good. I just want to point out what Paul says. Paul says they are at war with one another. They are enemies with one another. They cannot coexist. So here's the truth. If you're living in the flesh, you are not living in the Spirit. If you're living in the Spirit, you are not living in the flesh so that you cannot do what you want to do. Do you hear that? It's saying that if you're living in the Spirit, no matter how much you want to, you can't live in the flesh. Thanks be to God. Man, if I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm doing that, I mean, I'm just living in the Spirit of God, it says I cannot do the things of the flesh. But if you're walking in the flesh, your desires, your passions, your wants, if it's all about you, Hear this, you cannot do the things of the Spirit. They do not coexist. And so we get to this place of, 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 of freedom, really. And Paul says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why? Because the Spirit is, has fulfilled the law through Jesus. That's done. But then Paul says, you may not understand what these things of the flesh are. So let me tell you. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are obvious. That word works is something that is produced. It's something that happens because someone is participating or doing something. And these works of the flesh are things that you and I participate in. And they become works. They become something that's born out of what we do. That should frighten us. Because these works that we're producing are not only negatively impacting us, but they're negatively impacting everyone around us. I was speaking recently to someone, and we were talking about how the sin, the choice of one person was impacting family, and it's impacting friends, and impacting marriage, and impact. That's what sin does. And so Paul unfolds these. 
He says, so the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity. Those are all sexual sins. Y'all, here's the thing. God has created us as sexual beings. Who God has created us as is good. We're the ones who have messed it up. And we've operated sexually outside of the parameters of what God designed. And when we do that, those are works of the flesh. And then it goes on. It says, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy. I know none of us do this, but just bear with me because Paul felt the need to write it. Outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar to these things. Fill in the blank. These are the works of the flesh. And do you know what the works of the flesh bring? Death. Y'all, sin brings death. It's the truth of Scripture and it's the truth of experience. In fact, Paul talks about this over in Romans 8. This is what he says, Romans 8, 6. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile to God. Because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him, God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you, then he, God, who raised Christ from the dead, will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the Spirit who lives in you. Do you see that? That if you're walking in the flesh, you are not a part of God. You can't love God. In fact, you are an enemy of God. But if you're in the Spirit, not only are you with God, but he is your life. He breathes life into you. He is your life. He's my life. So that's what Paul is talking about over in Galatians. He's saying, if you do these things, these works of the flesh, he said, you're going to lead to death. And then he goes on and says this, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Y'all, that's what this is about. Our whole life. That's what our whole life is about, is the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus taught about kingdom of God. See, here's the thing. A lot of us want to live our kingdom and we want to involve God a little bit. But God said, it's about my kingdom or not. And as I was preparing for this, one thing that came to mind for me is, is this question. If you're not interested in the kingdom of God, you're not going to be interested in these things. You're not going to want Jesus. You're not going to want to walk in the Spirit. You're going to want to do your own thing. So do you desire the kingdom of God? Do you desire His kingdom? Are you willing to submit your life, everything that you are, to His rule and reign? Because that's what He's calling us to. And so Paul, after saying that, he said, but this fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the works of the flesh are things that you do, things that are produced through our actions. But the fruit of the Spirit, you don't produce your fruit. You don't produce the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces the fruit in you. You just get to live it. You get to experience it. You get to express it to other people. So the fruit, and that word fruit is singular. It's not plural. It's not you can have a, a few of the fruit, but not, not other parts of the fruit. You may go, I really like the love joy thing. I don't really want to have the self-discipline thing. I like the fact that I can do whatever I want to do. No, these are singular fruit. And so it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And with these things, he says, there is no law. You're not bound by anything. You're free. How different would your workspace be? How different would your family be? How different would your friendships be if love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, that was what was flowing through your relationships? How much different would our world be? man, I hate to be on social media nowadays because I see people post a passage of Scripture. Jesus loves us. And then the next post is anger and hatred and vitriol. 
You can't live in the flesh and live in the spirit at the same time, y'all. Even if it's on Facebook. <laughs> you can't do it. But if you walk in the spirit, the fruit that the spirit creates within us is love, joy, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And with those things, you don't have to worry about the law because the law is being fulfilled in you, through you, and into the lives of the people around you. Is that not amazing that we get to express the very nature and character of God in the relationships that we're in because the Spirit of God lives in us? What a gift. If we walk in the Spirit. Paul continues. He says in verse 24, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus, because it's His kingdom, not ours, they have crucified their flesh with its passions and its desires. Y'all, when you and I make a decision to follow Jesus, Jesus comes hard after us. He loves us. He is after us. He's the one who initiates. He's the one who extends. But he says, okay, I'm here. And when you receive that love, when you receive that relationship, what it means is that you and I crucify our flesh. We put our flesh to death so that we can live in the beauty of Christ. It's the kingdom of God of Jesus, not the kingdom of God of Scott. Do you want the kingdom of God? Do you desire the kingdom of God? Do you want more of Jesus? Do you want more of the presence of God to fill you over and over as Paul talks about in Ephesians, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that the cry of your heart, Abba, Father? Fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. And y'all, there's some in here, there's someone in here who is not walking with Jesus right now and you're not going to experience the Holy Spirit. And I've talked to people and they're like, yeah, I feel like that was the Holy Spirit. No, it's heartburn. <laughs> because... The Holy Spirit will come after you, but the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you if you are not following, believing, and trusting in Jesus. And we've even, we've even tried to bring those things together. Just as we try to bring the flesh and the Spirit together, we try to bring the Holy Spirit alongside of our sin and go, oh, no, they can coexist. They can't coexist. That's where we quench the Holy Spirit. That's where we grieve the Holy Spirit. So the last thing I want to leave you with is a passage from Deuteronomy because I think it encapsulates what we're talking about. It's Deuteronomy 30, beginning in verse 19. It says this. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today. This is God speaking to the Israelites. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that so you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God. Obey Him. Remain faithful to Him for He is your life. And He will prolong your days as you live in the land. The Lord swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He stands before us today and He says, I have put before you life and I put before you death. I put before you prosperity and I put before you curses. And then he says this, and please hear this this morning, from the Word of God. Choose life. Choose life. Choose to walk in the Spirit. Choose to crucify the flesh. Choose to wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to give myself into that. And here's what will happen. You will commit to that and the Holy Spirit will work through you and you will potentially get through your day and you'll be able to reflect back on your day and you go, you know what? I don't recall, consciously recall sin in my life today. It doesn't mean you're sinless. It just means you're walking in the Spirit. See, some of y'all are kind of freaking out about this idea. I shared this with a pastor friend of mine. 
I was walking through it, and I'm like, man, this is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying if we walk in the Spirit, we will not gratify, will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And he's, he, he rolled his chair up right into my face, and we're sitting there face to face. And he was a very close friend, obviously. So we're, we're face to face, and he looks at me, and this is what he says to me. He's a godly man. He believes in Jesus, and this is what he said to me. He said, Scott, everything you're saying right now, everything you're saying sounds like heresy, but I know it's true. Because we don't teach it anymore. Because we don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit anymore. He is this forgotten part of the Trinity that we really go, oh yeah, the Holy Spirit, whatever. No, He empowers you and me to live a life that's pleasing to the Father, Abba, Father, because we are in relationship with Him. Y'all choose life. Choose to walk in the Spirit. He is your life. Pray with me. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus showed us what this looked like. Fully man, fully God, and yet he lived without sin. He lived in complete righteousness before you. He walked in the power that you placed within him. And then he came and he gave up his life for us, died for us, was raised from the dead, and sits at your right hand right now, and sent his Holy Spirit so that we could participate in the same thing, crying out, Abba, Father, crying out, God who is intimate to me, come and not only be with me, not only be around me, but be in me. I want to live a life that's righteous and pure and holy. And I know that it's only done through the Spirit. And so, God, I pray for everyone in this room that they would choose life and they would choose to walk in the Spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gift of this bread and this juice. And I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit and only the way that you can, that you would transform it for us to be the body and blood of Christ. Our salvation, which brings freedom, which brings life. God, let us experience that today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.